to my soul I seen them travel across the waters unknown let them be a witness to my soul stealing them and taking all they never should own let them be a witness to my soul I seen the devil grow as years went by let him be a witness to my soul and see the same devil take a worthy disguise let him be a witness to my soul welcome to a works and process with christopher rudd and rudder dance of witness at New Victory Theatre in New York. I'm Caroline Cronson, producer of Works in Process, the performing arts program at the Guggenheim. We are thrilled that Christopher is here with Rudder Dance at New Victory Theatre after their creative bubble residency up in the Hudson. New Victory Theatre has not just supported Rudder Dance through hosting today, but has supported Christopher Rudd through New Victory Lab Works. We always present a program behind the scenes in any piece that we support in order to illuminate the creative process. We should acknowledge that we're filming today on March the 16th. Theatre and the Performing Arts hasn't yet opened in New York, but we're lucky enough to be able to film in this beautiful theatre because the dancers have been through a quarantine creative bubble residency. As well as thanking New Victory Theatre, we would like to thank the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do what we want to do, which is to support artists in what they do, create, work and perform. So thank you, everybody. You'll now meet Christopher Rudd, the creator and the choreographer, who will be discussing his process with New Victory teaching artist, P. Tyler Britt. Thank you.
How are you? I'm, well, I'm a little exhausted and um, nervous and excited and I, yeah, I'm bubbling up from the bubble. <laughs> so can you tell us uh, a little bit about Witness? Witness is a three-part work that I call it my mix between art and activism. Uh, it takes the audience on a journey through time, depicting the black march towards equality. Yesterday, part one tackles the transatlantic slave trade and slavery in America. Part two tackles it called today, it literally tackles what we're dealing with today in terms of police violence, in terms of the oppression of black people by today's standards, and trying to show the similarities between the two um, time periods. And part three, tomorrow, is about how do we get to tomorrow. It's meant to open up a dialogue. It's meant to show offer avenues of reconciliation. It's meant to empower black people and to show a reality that we as a society are conditioned not to see. I believe that many of the world's problems are caused by people being desensitized to the oppression of others and to the humanity of others. And so Witness was conceived to viscerally depict our struggle and our humanity in one work. I feel like that collective feeling will start the process of having the conversations that can lead to reconciliation, that can lead to an appreciation for black people. That can lead to some healing. Healing. And one of the things that, about um, the year that we've lived is how necessary I think it is to go straight into to part three and not ending with today. Like we need to go into what reconciliation could look like. Um, one of the aspects of part three that I'm really, really excited about is the ability for the work to have people admit to things and say sorry for it out loud. <laughs> and I don't speak on behalf of all black people everywhere, um, but I know with me it's hard to let go of things I've done wrong. That ability to have that type of ritual within the process of the work is something I'm really excited about offering within the context of the piece. And being in the audience and hearing that, oh wow, the person I'm listening to in the music is the people sitting next to me. It's my actual community. And it's um, something I, I really can't wait to figure out how to bring that into fruition. I know the tales and stories old. I know the ancient strife. Yet nothing can prevail the soul for viewing with the eyes. With my Yes.
on to for a second, uh, go with me on this road, okay, um, okay. is that the, uh, got my bag, uh, is that the process was different um, or different compared to other choreographers. I'm hearing like via pulling from personal experience um, and then the really found communal experiences that you're having while working together and then sharing similar cultural mm. backgrounds mm. and experiences, which as a, as a fellow black man, I understand. Um, uh, can you speak to a bit how it what that process would look like what the collaborative process was between you and your um dancers i i invite them to take as much artistic liberty as they feel they want to when i was a dancer i loved being given just a sketch and then finding a way to encompass the characters i'm trying to play like trying on different um, different clothes to what this character would wear. And I'd like to offer that. I recognize how difficult it can be and how the effect it can have on them, especially dealing with such a topic that we're talking about racism and oppression of Black people today. I use an intimacy director to help um, maintain the mental welfare of the artist, especially in a piece like this. Um, during the creation of part one, it was difficult, but it was easy to separate our lives from the characters we were playing. Yes, we're playing our ancestors, and yes, we're playing um, black people, but we're playing enslaved black people, which we have the benefit of, of time to distance ourselves from. So in terms of how deeply I want people to tap in, how deeply I want them to invest themselves in their creative muscles and their willingness to, to take themselves into places that aren't necessarily comfort or comfortable, I feel like the impact of the work is greater because of the, the deep investigations and the, and the tough conversations and the tears that we cry and literally the blood that we shed during the process. Um, you'll notice that a lot of the chains and the bungee, it's just dangerous physically, like, mm. but it's also because of how deeply we tap into the story and the lives of the, of the characters we're developing, like, it also taps into like, oh wait, like, that could have been my cousin, that could have been me. All of the, the, the news articles or the news clippage are things we've all lived through that we've all been witness to. And there are times that we're working and we're, we're, we're also remembering like where we were when we first heard of that story or that story. And, and it, it's, it's challenging. So great care goes into the, in, into the details of how we are creating the work and not just the work that we're creating. I conceived of this work with Trayvon Martin and now it's six years later, and after the year that we've all lived through, one of the big questions we're asking ourselves is like, do we really want to see any more harm on black bodies? Like, is this piece, should we just like, is it too much for our society right now? What effect will it have on black children? Children in general, like I, um, there has been so much violence that there's no real need to talk about the specifics of what's happened within the last year. And I feel we as a cast of black creators, I don't know if we could have handled going into the specifics of last year within the context of creating this work. It was enough to create characters who, and tap into what these characters could have felt 
within the context of the structure of this story, which is equally as important for everyone to be able to viscerally feel the struggle that Black people feel in order to say, yo, <laughs> like, how are we letting this happen in 2021 still, you know? In Charlotte, North Carolina, a man involved in a car accident over the weekend went looking for help and wound up dead. He was shot again and again by a police officer who is now facing criminal charges. It is the video that investigators did not want you to see. Tonight, Channel 3 News has obtained recordings of that November police chase that ended with the shooting deaths of two unarmed suspects. Channel 3's Dave Summers got a copy of the tape and Dave... This video is just unbelievable. America's largest police force is facing a serious controversy over a video that's gone viral showing officers arresting a suspect who later died. The video is wrenching, and here's ABC's Ron Claiborne. There is growing outrage tonight after an unarmed African-American teenager was shot and killed by police in the St. Louis suburb of Ferguson, Missouri. But there are conflicting reports about what led up to the shooting. NBC's John Yang has the details. On the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, outrage and anger. Protesters of different ages and races demanding answers in the shooting death of 18-year-old Michael Brown at the hand of the death of 12-year-old Tamir Rice, who was killed by Cleveland police while he was playing with a realistic-looking BB gun uh, in a Cleveland park. The entire interaction lasted less than three seconds before the boy was dead. The police officers pull up, the boy falls over, he's dead. Running this way, he turns his body towards this way, hands in the air, being compliant, he gets shot in his face and chest and goes down and dies. The officers move in to arrest him. One of them puts his forearm around Garner's neck. More police join in, hitting him to the ground as he cries out. Three police officers respond. When Farrell ran toward them, Officer Randall Carrick drew his gun and shot Farrell ten times. Dead man was unarmed. Jumped up onto the hood of the car, stood on the car, stood on the car, and then fired down through the windshield into the vehicle at those two. My investigators say it was not hard, was fatally shot. I don't want to bury my son. My son should be buried me. Georgia Farrell says her son Jonathan respected the police. His sister is a cop. The father of six was rushed to a local hospital where he dies. My nephew just two days ago was looking for his daddy. Where's daddy? Charlotte Mecklenburg police said he did not have a lawful right to discharge his weapon. Dead man was unarmed. Michael Brown graduated from high school earlier this spring and was to begin college next week. His mother, Leslie McSpatton, has a message for the officer who killed him. You're not God. You don't decide when you're going to take somebody from her. If that was the case, I brought her. I should have took her from her. That was mine. That belongs to me. Ten different Cleveland police officers fired their guns into that car. And yes, the two people uh, in that car were killed. Look at the bullet markers there. 69, 70, 72. 137 shots into the car. I don't want to bury my son. My son should be burying me. Garner's wife collapsing by his side. The incident has stirred racial tensions in this city. Witnesses said Brown's body lay in the street for hours. They treated him like he was a New York bomber. And the New York bomber is alive right now. He's alive, but my brother is dead who didn't commit a crime. It is a scene like something out of a movie. Now they just snatch my heart right out my chest like I'm down my empty shell right now. Thirteen different Cleveland police officers fired their guns into that car. Chris, many in the Cleveland community were astonished at the numbers in this pursuit. Eleven officers fired 137 bullets into the suspect's car. The shooting sparked a furious reaction. Police responded in force, brandishing assault rifles. Farrell, a former collegiate football player, had no criminal record. 137 shots in the car. The officers in that case uh, were not brought up on murder charges. Do you have questions? I have questions, but they will be answered soon. 
I, I remember I was reading like your thoughts um, when you were doing touche with America, mm. and the worry was that you have to compromise the mm. work mm. Um, to fit in. Um, I'm gonna totally paraphrase you, um, but to compromise the work to fit in with the already established mm. culture. I actually, think I did. I think I, I think <laughs> I'm like. Because. I think that was. <laughs> you did some I'm gonna. Research. I'm gonna. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, uh, to, 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 <laughs> um, do you feel like you've had to do that at all in this process? No, 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 no. no. Mm -hmm. In fact, like um, the the question like that we're at like that we're asking me or I'm asking me or I'm, not, I'm trying to establish is like how young of an audience should we reach for with this work? And the instruction was like, don't change the art, make the work, and then we'll answer that question later. Like, make what you think the work should be. And I feel like. You know, when I think of theater for young audience, I, I naturally go to a place of of um, something that's more Disney, as opposed to something that's that I'm doing, and that's not necessary. Like, and that's one of the things that I feel like I've been learning here. Like the conversation I'm having with the educational department, the conversation I'm having with the artistic director of programming, the, con the conversation I'm having with everyone is, is helping me the, stay truer to myself in terms of this is what I believe is important, this is how I believe the story should be ta told, this is the impact I want to make, and then let's learn how to make the work and then market the work accordingly. It's, it's, it's vital that young people watch this particular piece when it's created and in its full glory and especially you know the first time i was called the n-word i was really young <laughs> you know what i mean it's like wait like like the first time people use it like how young are they and like can they already start the process of being like oh wait that was bad i i'm sorry i did that and can they start the process of going on a different path you know the, like yeah the phrase the children are our future isn't just a phrase like the truth of it is like okay like to use my work as propaganda so that i am correcting or combating what white supremacy has done in our society in a way that kind of stops it from from the jump. It, like I want to reach as young as I can in order to combat it as soon as I can. And when I look at the question, how young should white children be having conversations about racism? The answer is as young as black children are being, are, are feeling racism. And that's a pretty young age. But with the work itself, we have to ask ourselves, can this work do harm to children? And like, at what age will it not do harm? At what age can they understand the context as well as um, have conversations around it, as well as just be blown away by the beauty <laughs> that we're making and the and the impact of the work with the work. Okay, he's in, so we're gonna start. Places, please, places, please, places for the bottom of witness part one yesterday. Places, please. Lights. Camera. Music. Go. How important mm. has it been, or how, um, Mm, important is the word I want to use, but um, how um, much of an impact is it? Yeah, and it, an impact Whew. has it had to have those type of partnerships um, while you, for you, in creating. I can honestly say that it's been a lifesaver to be able to to have, um, and it's it's not necessarily the financial support, but just someone believing that I can do what I believe I can do. It's like having like <laughs> someone to hold a shoulder every once in a while. I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> like, you know, like that kind of like um, reigniting of um, 
the inspiration, reignited of of the reigniting the the drive, reigniting the yeah. Hello. I need you all to hear me tonight. One year ago, yesterday, I lived the worst nightmare anyone could imagine. I watched as my daughter, Sandra Lance, was lowered into the ground in a coffin. Audiences, whether it be young people, whoever takes in this piece, what you witness want them itself. witness itself, what you want them to, what do you want their takeaway to be? I mean, I could easiest answer, shortest answer, most concise answer: Black lives matter. It, it actually does, and it's not um, a controversy to say that, and it shouldn't be a controversy to say that. It is. A matter of fact. Period. Oh, Period. Yes. You're here. You're here. You're here for that? Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, and I'm going to let that land there. So thank you very much for this time today. No worries. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you to Works in Process at the Guggenheim. Thank you to New Victory Theater, Labworks. I have never, like, it is hard to be me. First of all, first and foremost, but like, it has been hard to live through this pandemic, and it is a blessing to feel that my work and my company are one of the ones that the powers that be believes is worthy of surviving and coming back and making a difference and being a caretaker for the craft going forward. Yeah. Well said. Thank you. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Let them be a witness to my soul. I know the hour is drawing nigh. Let them be a to my soul when night will be over and the sun will rise let them be a witness to my soul
Jesus to my soul. If there is one who know like I know, there is one who know like I know. If there is one who know like I know, let him be a witness to my soul. Oh, let him be a witness to my soul. Let him be.